Prayer can be daunting and challenging, and many of us don't even know where to begin. Yet God calls us to draw near to Him, to speak with Him, praise Him, and share with Him our struggles and anxieties. This prayer is an essential part of our relationship with God. We can find wonderful guidance about prayer in the Bible. The Book of Psalms is a collection of prayers and hymns that God inspired His people to write in order to teach us how to draw near to Him in prayer. I'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for allowing us to come into your presence to worship you in freedom. Um, what a privilege we have, O Lord, when so many of our brothers and sisters around the world uh, do not have this freedom, O Lord. But Father, we pray that, uh, that, 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 that you touch our hearts, O Lord, as we go through our passage today, O Lord, that, that you will open our hearts and our minds to receive your word, and that you will change us, O Lord. Holy Spirit, fill me up, O Lord, so that, so that the words that I speak, o Lord, may it, ed, may it worship you, may it glorify you, O Lord, and may it build your church up. And may I, may I not be glorified, O Lord. May I be humbled in your presence along with, the, with everyone who's listening to my words, O Lord. May we all be convicted. Thank you for hearing our prayers. We love you. Amen. Amen. Uh, all right. How many of you have heard of this uh, TV show called A Game of Thrones? Anybody? Anybody willing to admit? <laughs> so it it's known for its fascinating and complicated storylines and its gratuitous, its 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 excessive, sometimes violent and violence and sexuality. But you know, when we look at the Bible, right? I mean, we see that sometimes reality trumps fiction, and we have no shortage of just accounts, right? True historical accounts that display the evil that humanity is capable of, right? So the difference is that in reality, God acts. He hates evil and he acts to punish and judge evil. Now you take David, for example, right? I mean, he's the shepherd boy who killed the giant Goliath. I mean, you guys have heard of David and, you know, his little stone, right? Uh, then you've heard, you know, this guy later became a great soldier. He helped uh, Israel's king at that time, Saul, to defeat Israel's greatest enemy, the Philistines. Right? You have David and his good friend Jonathan, right? Like one of history's greatest friendships, you know. And later, as you know, Saul's jealousy of David grew, right? He thought that this guy was going to take over his kingdom. Uh, David fled from Saul, right? And he becomes like, you know, sort of like the mix between a pastor and, a, and Robin Hood. And, you know, during this time, he's also writing a lot of the Bible, right? He's writing a lot of the Psalms. And later, you know, God brings him into what he was promised, which is the kingdom of Israel. He becomes the king of Israel. He wins more victories, you know, his reverence. He is known for loving and worshiping God. And his good leadership ushers in an age of peace and security for his people. Literally, for the next 80 years, his people are living in just this, this, this golden age, right? Thereby securing his place as Israel's greatest king. As if that wasn't enough, God promises David that one of his male descendants would rule over everything, everyone, everywhere, and for all time. And of course, we know who this person is. It's Literally, God the Son, Jesus, right? Who is the, the ultimate son of David. So, you know, we look at this guy, right? He has it all, you know, power, wealth, prestige, God's promises, God's love for him. He's got a huge family that all adore him. But as it turns out, our hero was not perfect. He had a bit of a, you know, he had a bit of a wandering eye, right? And, you know, one day, right, one night rather, as he's taking his evening walk after his dinner maybe, you know, on the roof of his palace, he spies with his little eye a beautiful woman bathing. And he finds out that she's married to one of his bravest and most loyal soldiers. And what does he do? He gets guys to kidnap her and then he rapes her. Even worse, right? After he finds out that she's pregnant to prevent like a scandal from erupting, he murders her husband, right? By, by ordering his general to abandon this poor guy at the front line to just face all the enemies uh, by himself. 
It's all like uh, the Revenant, I think. Uh, if you if you've seen that movie, but anyways, the cover up worked, though, right? I mean, unlike most of history's cover ups, this one actually worked. Not many people knew, right? And 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 David went on his merry way, fully confident that no one would ever know about his sin. He would continue in this, you know, this horrible and sick attitude for about a year before God sends his prophet Nathan to confront him about his sin. Now, Dave, now God's not doing this to destroy David, right? He's he doesn't, despite all the horrible things that David has done, weirdly enough, God still loves him. Right? He wants his relationship with David to be restored because he loves him so much. Now, that's the backdrop against which David wrote Psalm 51, our passage for today. Um, so, you know, so far we've been going through uh, our summer series in the book of Psalms entitled Draw Near, and we're almost at the end. Woohoo! And we've seen so far, right, how praise, thanksgiving, seeking wisdom, and lamenting are all vital, right? Are all vital to draw to, to helping us draw closer to God. Now, most of these, right? Most of these can be done in private, right? You can just keep it in a nice little circle of confidence between you and God. Now, all of these are also relatively comfortable, right? I mean, who's I mean, tell me, who's gonna anybody in Voyage, right? Who's gonna ridicule you if you know you you're 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 praising and thanking God for his mercies, right? I mean it's it's a wonderful thing to see somebody doing that. Now, today we are gonna look at something really, 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 really uncomfortable, okay? We're gonna consider how confessing our sins will draw us near to God. Right? Now confession is the hardest and most painful and sometimes the most humiliating way of drawing near to God, right? Because it's when we say to God and to another human being, I have done wrong, mea culpa, right? As the Romans would say, and admit our helplessness before him to somebody else. Right? That's, that's, that's the essential essence of co uh, confession, right? We can't just keep it between ourselves and God. We have to share it with somebody else. And yet, despite the pain, despite the humiliation, it's probably the very first step that each of us need to take before any of the others, before we can praise God, before we can thank Him, before we can seek wisdom. Why? Because it puts all of these things into the perspective of our imperfection and God's perfection. So uh, let's read through our uh, passage, Psalm 51. For the choir director, a psalm of David. When the prophet Nathan came to him after he had gone to Bathsheba, verse 1, Be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion. Blot out my rebellion, completely wash away my guilt, and cleanse me from my sin. For I am conscious of my rebellion, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you alone I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. So you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Surely you desire integrity in the inner self. And you teach me wisdom deep within. Purify me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Turn your face away from my sin and blot out all my guilt. God, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of your salvation and sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. And then I will teach the rebellious your ways and sinners will return to you. Save me from the guilt of bloodshed, God. God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not want a sacrifice, or I would give it. You are not pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not dis despise a broken and humble heart, O God. In your good pleasure, cause Zion to prosper. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices, 
whole burnt offerings, and then bulls will be offered in your altar. This is the word of the Lord. Now, as we consider our passage, I want us to notice three characteristics of biblical confession, okay, that we have from our passage today. So the first is that a true confession is full and sincere. It does not minimize our guilt. The second is that true confession leads to and is always followed by repentance and surrendering ourselves completely to God's will. And the third point follows from the first two, right? The test of a true confession is a changed life. Now, before we go further, if you have any questions, please text them to our Voyage number, which has been updated. Uh, somebody shouted out. Oh, no, there you go. You can send a text anonymously to 514-600-7736. Once again, that's 514-600-7736. If you text it, I will try to answer them during our live Q&A uh, at the end of the service. And if I can't answer it, Andrew will. Uh, anyways, now too often, right, too often we hear of, you know, politicians or leaders offering, you know, these insincere apologies after being caught doing wrong. And understandably, we're just a little bit cynical of any public admission of guilt, right? Are they sincere? Are they, you know? But here, we have David who successfully covered up his sins. And yet when God confronts him, what does he do? He writes a psalm admitting his guilt and addresses it to the chief musician. He is not playing here, this guy. And he doesn't just, you know, just write a psalm and just give it. He also gives the story behind the song that's so popular among musicians today. He is not, he's not trying to hide anything. From verse 3, we see that he is ready, ready to admit his guilt, right? Everywhere he looks, he's reminded of it, right? For example, he, when he takes his evening walk on the palace roof to enjoy the cool breeze, he's reminded of how he, uh, you know, how he lusted and acted out on his sinful desires. When he looks at Bathsheba, who he's now taken as his wife, he's reminded of how he degraded her. He considers his child born out of rape, who dies, by the way. He's reminded of how he's directly responsible for this child's death. When he looks at his great army, right, the one that helped him win all those victories, he's reminded of how he betrayed one of their own. But wor worst of all, worst of all, in verse 4, right, we, he's, he's all too aware that he is sinned most of all against God by dishonoring his image contained within these human beings. And that, and, and that too, knowing fully well that God sees everything. Beloved, sin is serious. There is no such thing as a victimless crime. Banish that thought from your mind. There is no such thing as unimportant victims. We don't just hurt ourselves and our others as if that, were, that, that weren't enough. Right? We hurt God every time we disobey his commands. It's, you know, think about it, okay? It's like us and our parents, or if it's, you know, if you're a parent, it's like you and your children, right? So my parents set rules for my brother and I growing up, and it was born out of their life experiences and basically just wanting the very best for us and because they love us, right? Because they're our parents. Now, whenever we hurt each other or disobey our parents, Right? They were also hurt too, right? because we didn't trust them and their judgment about what was best for us. God loves us so much more than that, right? that he only wants the very best for us. He doesn't want what is good for us. Right? There's that saying, good is sometimes the enemy of the best. This is very much the case over here. He wants the very best for us. He gave us the Bible, which contains his perfect design and his purpose for humanity. Now, I know, I'm sure that most of us have heard Pastor Cody say this time and again. Now, if you're using something, right, and go against the intended design or purpose, you're going to be breaking it pretty soon, right? And it's just the same with us. And God's judgment, it's not God being a jerk. It's just the natural consequence of going against his design. Now, many of us are uncomfortable with the idea of God as a judge, right? We like him as God who loves and cares and, you know, all that. But God as judge, 
right? But, but, but think about this, okay? God is described in passages like, you know, Psalm 82 or, you know, Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. He's really interested and he's very concerned about the helpless, right? He's the defender of the weak against the strong. We just sang that in the very first song. He makes the wrongs right. So when we sin, guess what we're doing? We are creating victims, and God will act on behalf of those victims to make the wrongs right. It's very telling, you know, that you know, when you look at the Ten Commandments, it deals with relationships. It deals with relationships with God, with ourselves, and with others as well, right? And every sin we ever commit is an action that hurts. Now, when we look at verse 5, though, right, and when, you know, when David is admitting that he was evil and guilty of uh, offending God even from birth, it's not, not, it's not a cop-out from, from on David's part, right? He's not excusing his behavior by claiming, you know, I can't help myself, God. This is ha- hardwired into me. He is looking at himself in horror and disgust, right? He's rapidly realizing that he's a bad guy. He's a monster, right? Everything in his life. Right? His conscience, his family, his kingdom, his security, it's everything that he valued is just corrupted by sin's power. He's been living a double life, right? He's appearing to be a good guy, but in reality, he's actually a truly horrible human being. How many of us can identify with that? I can, for sure. Each and every one of us, whether we realize it or not, we're secret hypocrites. Contrast this against what God demands of us in verse 6, right? God demands that we, we ourselves are united, that our values match our inner reality. We are to worship God sincerely and with that lovely word integrity, right? Integrity is defined as a quality of being honest or the state of being whole or undivided, right? So, you know, when you talk about a, a country's integrity being affected, that's talking about a country being divided. But that applies to us as well, right? Because God wants us to be both honest and whole. So, again, right, repeating, we know God's wisdom from the Bible, but when we disobey Him, we willingly abandon that, right? But when our whole lives, you know, when, when you think about it, when our whole lives are just defined by presenting our best our best foot forward and then hiding our worst qualities, right? And we've completely rejected true wisdom in favor of our own reasoning. We know best for our own lives. And then for God or anybody else to, to demand that we radically change ourselves, right, in our own power, it's kind of, it's, it's, you know, I mean, when all that is, you know, you have all that baggage weighing on you, it's kind of useless, right? It's kind of like asking a drowning guy to save himself with no way of floating, right? With no life ring or a life jacket or whatever. But notice verse 6 again. Help is present, right? Verse 6 is in the present tense. God is patient with humanity and his children in particular. He offers us a new way. Right? which is the best way to lead our life and interact with himself and others, right? Which comes from how? Which comes from turning towards himself and following him, right? Now, this is called repentance, right? So, repentance is just a fancy word for, you know, you're going your way and then you turn around and you're going towards God. Now, as we, if we skip down to verses 16 through 17, we see that repentance doesn't begin by offering sacrifices to God. It's like, it's like telling God, God, here's my, pay- here's my payment for my sins. Thanks. Have a good day. Have a great life. A truly repentant or penitent person realizes that their debt is what? Infinite and unrepayable, no matter what we do. And the only thing, the only option we have is to throw ourselves at God's mercy. As we turn towards God in repentance, right? He's going to demand us to surrender some things in our lives. No, he's going to demand that we surrender everything to him, right? Our possessions, time and talents, of course, right? But also our sins and character defects, the things that we are trying to hold on to. 
He's going to give us clarity of mind to consider all of these, to look at all of these from his perspective, which is that sin has corrupted us, and he's going to let us be broken at how badly we fail God. In our sinful state, we have not used our money or our time or our talents wisely or for good all the time. I know I haven't. And our sins and character defects cannot be counted. And like David, what do we do? We, 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 we hate ourselves, right? We hate ourselves and we begin to desire God and to be on His side and to please Him. We need to be ready to surrender everything, everything from our sinful life to God, both the good aspects and the bad. And notice in verse 17, God does not despise this, this measly offering, right? This horrible offering. It, it pleases Him. It pleases Him when we offer our corrupt and humbled selves to Him. And how amazing is that? How amazing is that? Think about it. It's like a person who hasn't bathed in days and is stinking of the street with torn and unwashed clothes, just coming up to God, the highest and most excellent power in this entire universe, and being accepted and welcomed as somebody who pleases Him. Isn't that stunning? And why is that? Why, why are we accepted? If we, if we come with that attitude. Is it, is it our evil selves that God is pleased with? Right? Is it with our realization that we're terrible creatures? No, that's just called clarity, right? That's just clarity. God is pleased, though, with Jesus, God the Son, who took all our sins upon himself. He paid all our debts on our behalf to God and thus made us right or justified before God when he was sacrificed on our behalf on the cross. That is a sacrifice that God accepts as atonement for sins. All we're doing, right, all we're doing when we are offering ourselves to God is we are crucifying ourselves along with Jesus, right? We are joining Jesus on that cross and agreeing with him and saying seeing, seeing with him that our sins are horrible and we die to our old selves. We declare war upon our sins and we share in Jesus' once and for all victory over those sins by being raised up to new life. Now we're going to get that, get to that in a bit. But notice, God does not just leave us in our broken state, right? He doesn't just leave us, you know, convicted and just like, oh my goodness, I'm such a terrible person. In verse 7, God washes us. God purifies us, and thus we are made clean. There's nothing on our part that we can do to make ourselves clean, but God does that for us. Fun fact, that purification with hyssop that's mentioned in uh, verse uh, 7, right? That's for people who have just been cured of leprosy or being into contact with dead people, right? Two of the most ceremonially unclean people in the Old Testament, right? It's just humiliating, right? You, and, and, and that's what repentance is. Repentance can be humiliating because we are saying that we were suffering with this away from God's people, away from the eyes of the world, and now we are bringing this up to you. We are saying we were suffering with this, right? And how do we know this? How, how do we know that, the, that, 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 that this whole ritual was humiliating? Because under the Old Testament, any person undergoing this ritual had to present themselves publicly to the priest in the temple in Jerusalem, right? In the capital of the city. That's as public as you can get. And they were publicly admitting that they were clean and unclean and now desire to be clean. Now, as if repentance <laughs> wasn't humiliating enough, guess what? Some of the physical consequences may still remain, right? Some of the physical consequences of our sins. In verses 8 and 14, David is still consumed with the guilt of his sins, even as he knows that he has been forgiven, right? The pain is so great, right? He compares it to having all his bones crushed, right? Have you, has, has anybody crushed their fingers, say, with a hammer? It's, it's, it's an intense pain, to say the least, right? And when we look at the physical aftermath of David's life, 
or rather of the of his sins you know you'll see that it was a really rough time for him right his oldest son rapes his half sister that sister's full brother uh, who was another of david's sons murders the first son and then stages a coup and rapes his father's official mistresses right there's two massive civil wars david comes out on top but it's just a mess that david is created with his sins now, at the, at the time that he is writing this psalm, he can't see it at that time, right? Because it's not happened yet. But he is not seeking to escape any of this. He's not seeking to protect or even restore his reputation. He knows that all of these is meant to discipline and humble him and to remind him of the ultimate punishment from which he has escaped, right? Notice in verse 11, Right? What is that ultimate punishment? Being banished from God's presence and the Holy Spirit being removed completely from his life. There's a word for that. It's hell. Beloved, nowhere does the Bible promise escape from all consequences of our sins on earth. God shows us grace and mercy by making good come out of evil. Right? Sometimes he shields us from the full consequences of our sins. But always, always in his rich and abundant love, he uses the consequences and his mercy and grace to humble and to discipline us, to build us up and enable ourselves, uh, enable us rather, to see ourselves and others as he sees us, as he wants us to be, right? as the ultimate of his creation. Right? The ones, you know, after he created, he said, this is very good. We are worth infinitely more than we can see or we can ever imagine. Now, it follows, like I said then, that the ultimate test of this, all this, you know, confessing and repenting is a changed life, is a radically changed life. And how does God do that? God does that by giving us a new life. Notice verse 10, God create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. If some of you remember that old Keith, Keith Green song, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Notice, David is not asking God to, to, to remake him maybe with a, you know, with, a, with the tightening of the, the screws here, to, here and there, maybe a few tweaks. Remember in verse 5, he's just admitted that corruption is just hardwired into him, right? And he hates his former self. Uh, if we if we flip down to Romans uh, six chapter six verses six through eleven, and that'll come up on your screen momentarily. Romans six verses six through eleven. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be rendered powerless, so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin. And since a person who has died is freed from sin. Now, we, now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Because we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will not die again. Death no longer rules over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all time. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Amen? So you too consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. So we see that this new life is radically different from the old, right? We know that the old patterns still linger, right? Because it still lives within us. It will only be destroyed when Christ comes. But we pray along with God to renew that day new life daily, right? Why? Because our old self is older and stronger. It's been with us ever since we've been born, Right, so, like a friend of mine said that you know when you're living that new new uh, Christian life, that old life is just doing push-ups and getting stronger and stronger and stronger and just waiting to ambush you. We have no that that new life of us is completely dependent upon God, but God gives us the strength to daily fight and weaken that old life. And as we see in verses 8 and 15, this new life is joyful, right? It's, we are not a sad lot. We are, we are joyful, right? Even as we are dealing with these old patterns and habits, because 
Our joy is no longer in ourselves or what we have, but it's in God himself, our ultimate joy and our ultimate peace. Again, in verse 15, God intends for us to publicly testify about our life, past and present, struggles and everything, and victories as well. Not that we may boast in how great we are. Oh, look at me. I've changed my life. I've turned my life around. No, that's not God's intention. But that we may boast about how great our God is. Right? We are sharing publicly how, you know, our, all our humiliating struggles. Right? The fact that we fail, that we are human. But we're also testifying about how great and our life experiences, even when we did wrong, right? And, and thus, we can share those lessons we've learned or are continuing to learn. We can ho offer hope to the broken and warn those who are going astray. Beloved, let me ask you, what, what hidden sins are you holding on to? And what's holding you back from giving it up to God? If you're truly God's child, okay, He's not going to let you remain in your sins. Like I said, he wants the very best for you. He is going to expose your sins to the light, right? That you may be healed, right? Those old sins, they may be a part of you, but they're destroying you. You need healing. You don't need, you, you don't just need like a few tweaks. One reason that it can be so hard, or that rather it is so hard to follow God, is that we don't want to cooperate him, with Him, right? We letting go of some of these hidden, hidden character defects and bottles can just be so painful. Letting go of our coping mechanisms when things are going wrong, right? Letting go of the people you may idolize. Maybe changing the language or giving up the media, some of the media that we consume. Letting go of our career, career goals, life plans, right? And surrendering them to God and His will. It's all painful and it's, it's very, very hard. It's very hard. Because all of these are ultimately different forms of self-worship. That's what they are. We can't avoid the pain of giving up hidden sins and past baggage because we are all idolaters. idolaters. We have all rebelled against God. It is painful. It's hardwired, hard baked into us. But, but we can certainly mitigate the pain by cooperating with God and openly cooperating with Him and confessing our sins to one another. Although in that moment when we are doing that, it can seem excruciating. But I promise you, from my personal experience, it will lead to healing and restoration of relationship with God. James, you know, he uh, like the the, uh, the 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 writer James in the New Testament, in chapter five, verses fifteen through sixteen, he thought very highly of confessing our sins both to God and to others. Right in verse fifteen, the prayer of faith will save the sick person, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. As we obey God and confess our sins to Him and to our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, as we turn to God in repentance and side with Him, right, go to His side, as He cleanses us of our sins, guess what? Our lives will change, right? First, at the moment when we accepted Christ, and then throughout our lives as we continue to follow God. And we will continue to change until we enter Christ's presence in eternity because that's when our old selves will be destroyed and we will be made perfect, finally. Now, a word of warning, just a word of warning over here, right? Be wise with whom you choose to be vulnerable. Right? The goal of confession is humility and healing and restoration of relationships. It's not to ostracize. It's not to humiliate. It's not to victimize you. It's not a call to self-criticism. Right? Do it in a place of confidence where you know that what goes on within the group will not be shared outside. Right? Now, a great place to do that here at Voyage Church 
is at one of the many discipleship groups, right? We have separate discipleship groups for men and women, right? And within those groups, absolute confidence is a basic requirement, right? And it's meant to encourage people to just be themselves, right? Let their hair down and just share the things that have been burdening them. Now, my non-Christian friend, I want to ask you, are you, are you weary of sin today? Maybe you're just jaded by the hypocrisy you see within leadership and especially within the church, right? Maybe that latest scandal among the so-called people of God doesn't surprise you anymore. Maybe in this world where mass shootings, war, natural disasters, and injustice, are, it's just all a matter of course. There's a part of, there may be a part of you that just knows that there is something wrong, that there is something better out there, and you want it. Maybe you wish to share with David's joy, right, and peace that he has in Psalm 51. You can have it. You can have it. I promise you. But you must confront yourself. You must confront your destructive behaviors and patterns and baggage. Maybe you don't even realize that you need to change, right? I was where you are, where you may be today, right? But God offers you a much better way, a much, much better way. Do you want unconditional love and joy? God loves you so much that Jesus, God the Son, He came and lived among us and He revealed the kingdom of God through His preaching and His life. And He gave His life in the place of anyone who believes in Him to purchase our entrance into heaven. He loves you so much that He wants relationship with you. And he suffered the ultimate penalty that David talks about in verse 11, just banished from God's presence. The Holy Spirit was not with him in that moment until the punishment for sin was satisfied. Do you wish your life was different? Jesus offers you one, right? A new one. This life is given to you as you, are ra- as you believe in him, right? As you die to your old self, he will raise you w- with himself in resurrection to new life. Do you want to impact the world for good? When you have this new life, right? God gives the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit to live within you, to live the life that God desires for you. And may I say, to do impossible things. All of this, is freely offered to you today. You only need to ask. I encourage you. I encourage you, take a good, hard look at your life. Ask those closest to you, right? The, like to ask you some hard questions, right? Questions like, what character defects do you see in me? Maybe what do you need me, need? what do you wish could change within me? Ask yourself those same hard questions. Ask yourself questions like, why do I act in certain ways? Or why do I get triggered? Dig deeper. Dig deeper. Don't be afraid. And you will find things hidden deep within, like deep under that outer shield that you put up to protect yourself, right? Which only reveal themselves at the right triggers. And guess what? Some of these you can't deal with, even with the help of others. But, but God can. But God can. And he will if you ask. I urge you. My friend, my, by the mercies of God, just call out to him today. He will respond. And, and if you wish, of course, you know, please talk with me or Sandeep or Phil or any of the others. We'd, we'd love to talk with you. Let's pray. Father God, confession, confession is so hard. Confession, especially, especially when it's with our, with, with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, can be hard. Because all too often we find judgment, Lord. But Lord, at the same time, help us to realize that if we are willing to just rely on you, we will find healing, Lord. We will find the right group, the right person to talk to who will keep our confidence. And Lord, when we do that, Lord, when you put those people in our way, maybe not hold back, but maybe you share with them everything, our victories, our, 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 you know, just the good things that have happened, but also the really bad things, the bad things that have happened to us and the bad things that we are responsible for. 
And Lord, work within us, Lord. Fill us up with your Holy Spirit as we go out and, 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 and make disciples and do things that honor you and praise you. Thank you for hearing our prayers. We love you. Amen.